Ladies and gentlemen, fellas, 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 welcome back to the channel and the podcast. Hopefully you're watching on the YouTube channel. If not, Hallows is doing on the podcast, but the YouTube channel, we got some new things going on, some new backgrounds, a new layout. I'm excited for how we can kind of play around with these video backgrounds right now. But yeah, welcome to that one, dude, of week five. We're going to be giving you a player at each position that is currently going too low owned, in my opinion. And that means right now, every single player that I have is currently at like below, right around 5% ownership, some of them below that number. That's where I kind of want to live in. Obviously, I can come on here and tell you the best plays. That's what the main videos are for right the picks video if you're just finding me right now i have a, other videos on this channel the final thoughts video a live streams that we do as well that's what that's for finding the optimal plays discussing some ownership pivots and things like this but this is me really diving down into all the projected ownership numbers and trying to pick out the exact player at quarterback running back receiver and tight end screw defenses we're not doing kickers either here i don't know what fantasy leagues and daily fantasy sports you're playing in that deal with kickers but we're trying to take advantage of the leverage spots in dfs tournaments. we had a huge week last week leveraging some of this as well and also talking about stacks as well and lower owned stacks is going to be important so be sure to hit the like and subscribe button on this channel as we are about to hit thirty thousand subscribers i appreciate you all a ton if you're listening on the podcast please do hit that five star rating and review for a chance to get entered into a fifty dollar giveaway now before we get into the position by position we're going to get this one it's going to be a quick hitting video so i appreciate it be sure to check out super draft the sponsor of today's show. You'll get a 50% deposit bonus up to $1,000 if you use the promo code SAL. That is SAL. I do have projections for Superdraft DraftKings and a bunch of other stuff linked down below on my Patreon to assist you out over there, but their contests still are not filling. They still have fantastic contests, $125,000 guaranteed main contest on Sunday slate. It is a multiplier format. So it's not like DraftKings or FanDuel if you're familiar with those sites where you just get a salary cap, right? It is a multiplier format. So you get times a certain amount of fantasy points depending on what that multiplier is. If a player is very good, let's say in Ezekiel Elliott, they might only get one times their points. That is the minimum. But let's say somebody's more of an underdog, like an Antonio Gibson with a 1.5x multiplier. That means that Antonio Gibson would get 50% bonus points on top of his points already. So it's a, it's a little bit of a strategy there. Ownership, also the projections. I have those down below. So promo code SAL, S-A-L, will get you a 50% deposit match up to $1,000. Check it out. Linked down below. Let's get into this video, everybody. And we're going to start it off with the first player right now who's about to pop up, a man who is absolutely ruthless, but potentially what happens when you hit the upgrade button on Baker Mayfield. And that bad boy is going to be Gardner Minshew. There he goes. Gardner Minshew right now. And this is interesting. He's going to be coming in at like 5% ownership. Now, a lot of quarterbacks will come in between like 3 and 5% ownership. This week, you're probably going to see a handful, maybe a half a dozen pushing towards around 8 plus percent. And then into the double digits, you'll get some chalkier players like Dak Prescott. You'll get some chalkier players, potentially like a Deshaun Watson and going from there in Mahomes, things like that. And those guys are the obvious best plays on the slate, in my opinion. You can include Daniel Jones to an extent, but all these guys are going to carry probably double digit plus ownership. So for the purpose of the show, I'm trying to identify somebody who has less ownership is going to be less owned, but they hire up upside because of that ownership to kind of break out. Now they might not break out as often, but they have that upside. That's the whole point of that one dude. And that one dude in Gardner Minshew at the quarterback position is going to be about 5% on. And this is a perfect leverage spot for your overall stacks, right? You're going to have a lot of people owning the other side of this game, Houston. Uh, Deshaun Watson's ownership right now is high. Will Fuller is picking up ownership. They'll probably jam in if they want to jam in somebody else into those game stacks. A lot of people don't game stack, but you have Randall Cobb, Brandon Cooks, who's just coming off of a goose egg, although he ran the most routes and played the most snaps. They said that they purposely tried to scheme him away last week, the defense. But just in general, the Houston side of this will be the highest owned in this game. Deshaun Watson, Will Fuller, David Johnson, whereas the opposite side is probably not going to be true. DJ Shark will pick up some ownership, but not a lot. And then when you stack him up with Gardner Minshew, you're going to have leverage on the opposite side of that game. With DJ Shark as your main option in stacking Gardner Minshew, if you just want to stack just a quarterback and a wide receiver, but I recommend it's always in all my lineups. I play game stacks for the capture the highest upside in GPPs and try and win them like we came in second place last week in the main big GPPs. Then you're going to go get DJ Shark and then pair him up with a LaVisca Chenault or a Keelan Cole for a game stack. Then you have a plethora of options to run it back with probably Fuller, but you also have Brandon Cooks, you have Randall Cobb as run back options. Now, Jacksonville runs the seventh most passing plays per game. So this is good. Either they're trailing in games and also they're just playing at a quicker pace. You're getting Gardner Minshew attempting the eighth most passes per game at about 37 per game. He's seeing the number seven overall red zone attempts per game. So upside, they're getting to the red zone this offense. That is good with over six red zone attempts per game. And he has a top 10 protection unit right now. So this offensive line that was really bad last year, they had a lot of young players. It seems so far through a quarter of the season that they're gelling nicely together and Minshew has time to throw. That time to throw has just resulted in 285 yards per game, eight total touchdowns so far in the year, a 7.7 yards per attempt, which is well above the overall NFL average of about seven and 24 implied total this week, which is good to see. So overall, he's playing very well right now. And the matchup that he's going to get is fantastic. So it's kind of mind boggling why he's so low on. Now, I obviously get why there's other options that are cheaper, like Daniel Jones and things like that. But from a leverage situation, I do like this. You have Houston number 27 in overall secondary and number 28 in pass rush. They're literally bottom five in the league in coverage and pass rush. JJ Watt is not the same JJ Watt, or at least it doesn't
doesn't seem like that anymore. And it's hard to blame him. He's been in the league for over a decade. He's had a ton of season ending injuries and the body is just aging there. So they're not getting past us. They're not protecting anything in the secondary. Maybe getting a new coach this week will help that out. But I don't really know how much that's going to help the talent of these players, especially against what I would call a decent offense right now in Jacksonville, which is kind of shocking to say that after a month ago, we thought they were going to be the worst team in the NFL. They still might be, but number two in true completion percentage and eight wide receiver drops this year. You're also getting a bonus of a little bit of rushing upside, 14 carries for 69 yards on the year. Very fitting for Gardner Minshew. So Gardner Minshew is going to be that one dude at the quarterback position. He is just way, way, way too low owned at this point. Next up at the running back position is going to be, so I'll be honest with you. I'll level with you. It was Jarek McKinnon. And I was very excited about Jarek McKinnon because he was going to be like 2% owned this week because he's priced up to 5,800. There's a lot of nice value options in that low 6K range that are probably studs in their offense and they have just a more solidified role. But Jarek McKinnon was the number one running back in his offense last week with 21 touches and seven receptions and played over 90% of the snaps, a career high. He was the elite of elite running back roles last week. But they're saying, as of me recording this in the morning, they're saying that Raheem Mostart is practicing ahead of this week. So if Mostart does come back, you would assume that McKinnon's not going to get this 90% snap share. But keep in mind that if indeed Mostart is practicing in limited variety and they say, you know what, he needs another week, if he's out, then yes, McKinnon would be another that one dude option. So there's a bonus for you. He was already charted in as my that one dude if Mostart wasn't going to practice. We got the news that Mostart was practicing, so it makes him not as appealing anymore. And the man that's going to be taking his place is going to be, bam, the rookie himself. And the rookies are just killing it this year, but Antonio Gibson right now. Redskins running back. It's really tough to like this team in general. Going from Dwayne Haskins to Kyle Allen, in my opinion, it might actually be a downgrade, although Dwayne Haskins has been really bad, so that's saying something. But right now you're getting Antonio Gibson back-to-back weeks. In week two, he saw 60 plus percent of the snaps, and I thought, okay, it's Antonio Gibson time. Now in back-to-back weeks, he's only seen 40% of the snaps so far, and this could just be a pass protection issue with J.D. McKissick out there, but also J.D. McKissick is running a lot of routes per week. So that's kind of capping the overall upside of Gibson, but it's also capping his ownership. Look, if we were getting more usage, if we were getting 65% usage in 25 routes run every single week out of Antonio Gibson, instead of 50% usage or 45% snaps overall in the season and only 14 routes per week, if we were getting that bonus, he wouldn't be this low owned. He wouldn't be this cheap. He would be $6,000 and he would probably be picking up somewhere around 15% ownership. So I think this is actually a nice little leverage spot for us because he's going to come in probably below 5% owned at $5,000, which is a nice price point. And what you got last week was 48% of the snaps. So getting very close to that majority role in the offense, 17 total touches was definitely the majority of the running backs from an opportunity share perspective, 128 yards and a total touchdown. He finished as the RB5 on the week. He has all the upside in the world if he can just get the touches. He's seen 11 touches in every single game and he's averaging 14 opportunities per game. That's 11 carries on the ground and three targets in the air. Last week, he got the upside in that. So that's a situation in a brutal matchup against the Baltimore Ravens where he piles it on. He goes and finishes as the top five RB in that type of a matchup. Now you're going to get a matchup against the Los Angeles Rams who we look at them as a pretty decent defense, but their run defense has been abysmal. It's ranked 25th in DVOA according to Football Outsiders and 30th overall in grades according to Pro Football Focus. That is not a good run defense. Now he's obviously not going to be in the best situation with Kyle Allen and them being big underdogs in this game to the Rams, but we saw that exact same situation playing out last week and at low ownership, he goes out there and he absolutely crushes it for about 25 fantasy point performance. So I'm going to like Antonio Gibson for that upside and the fact that we're buying this upside potentially a week early. Obviously, it's not ideal that he's not the lead back or the number one back in his backfield. Well, I think he's the number one back, but he's not the elite running back usage of 65%, 70% of the snaps because McKissick is out there and on the season right now, McKissick is averaging 21 routes per game in the running back department running routes and it's only for Antonio Gibson to get 14. So that's not a perfect split, right? We would like to see Antonio Gibson just running 25 to 30 routes and McKissick not on the field. But the veteran McKissick is still a good pass catching running back. The veteran McKissick has seen 50 plus percent of the snaps in back-to-back weeks. But here is the big thing. It didn't matter last week. Antonio Gibson at 48% of the snaps overall still saw a majority of the opportunities and he still ended up putting up a top five running back week. And there is still an upside and it could be as early as this week in week five. What happens, right? What happens if Antonio Gibson, they just say, you know what? This guy's killing it. He, we just gave him 17 touches last week as a rookie in a really tough spot. He absolutely killed it. Let's put him out there a little bit more. Let's see what he can do. Kyle Allen loved throwing it down to Christian McCaffrey, who Ron Rivera has already compared Antonio Gibson to Christian McCaffrey in the preseason in terms of their skill sets and abilities. Antonio Gibson looks like the best athlete, even including Terry McLaurin on the field, most dynamic player when he's on the field with the ball in his hands. If this is the week that they said, you know what, we gave him 17 touches in a tough spot last week. Let's give him that similar work or more this week. I would not be shocked. I would not be shocked to see that because you just saw it last week and he was able to produce. So why would you rear him back in this type of a matchup and arguably and definitely based on the stats so far, a better matchup. So Antonio Gibson, for me, I understand why he is not higher owned, right? He is not the lead back in a backfield. He is not going to be the perfect price point at $5,000 if you only get like 12 touches out of him. But I'm going to try and bank on the upside that, okay, you're only going to let this guy be two or 3% owned but there's an opportunity that he is just an absolutely fantastic back and potentially going to see 15 or 16 touches. Like I very much so believe that a month or two from now, we could be saying, wow, remember when Antonio Gibson was $5,000 against the Los Angeles Rams and nobody wanted to play him. And now he's $6,800 and everybody wants to play him. Like, I think we could be seeing that from this type of a talent. 
and I'm going to be buying it right now. Antonio Gibson is our that one dude for week five of the NFL season at the running back position. Next up, a that one dude, and it's just a pay up to be contrarian spot is going to be, bam, Stefan Diggs. Stefan Diggs coming in right now, projected for less than 5% ownership. Look, his usage is fantastic. You don't have to worry about Stefan Diggs being shadowed by a specific cornerback. We're getting a lot of uh, another team's cornerback one, because it's just very hard for that cornerback to be so versatile as Stefan Diggs is. Diggs this year is using 35% of his snaps out of the slot, 30% left, and 36% right. Most cornerbacks don't go into the slot. Most cornerbacks don't like moving to both sides of the field. So no matter what, Diggs is always going to find himself the best matchup, which is perfect to see. Now on the season, he's seen 92% of the snaps. He's ran 37 routes per game, which is top 12 in the NFL. And he's seen a 24% target share on over eight and a half targets per game. That is top eight in the NFL. He's getting all the usage in the world right now. So far this year, he has 26 receptions for over 400 yards, which means that he is leading the league right now in receiving yards and also leading the league in completed air yards. The completed air yards is pretty crazy because everybody wanted to say coming into the year and rightfully so to an extent that Josh Allen can't throw anything accurate, definitely not the deep ball. And sometimes he does look pretty pathetic on the deep ball, but any quarterback does at their times. And this year he's actually completing a lot of those deep balls and he's completing them to Stefan Diggs, who was somebody last year who thrived off of that, but Diggs is also thriving in all parts of the field right now. He just looks rejuvenated and really like his elite self right now, Stefan Diggs through uh, four weeks of the season. Not only is he seeing deep targets, but he's seen five red zone targets, which ranks six so far, tied for six in the NFL. He's top 10 in yards per route run. You have seen four drops, which is not that great, but I don't expect that to continue all that much. 15.5 yards per reception is good to see. And his weekly target share. So this is something to watch. And this would be at our detriment if I had to give you a bad thing. And maybe this is a reason why, obviously the reason why he's lower owned is because there's a ton of wide receivers. The Dallas wide receivers are cheap. There's a ton of wide receivers in the payup options that you have this week, DeAndre Hopkins a little bit cheaper. Amari Cooper is in my opinion, affordable. Then you have a bunch of guys in the 6k range that just look really good. $6,900 Tyree Kill is taking on a lot of ownership. So a lot of people are just forgetting about Stefan Diggs. He's coming off of a down week as well. His targets per week so far have been 9, 13, 6, and 7. So keep a close eye on this because he only had 13 targets the past two weeks after having the first two weeks of the season, 22 targets. That could maybe be a little bit of a concern. Could it be a matchup thing? Could it be the fact that Devin Singletary was getting a little bit more usage on the ground the past two weeks? I think it's a little bit of both. You also had a really hot start, like an uncharacteristically uh, unattainable historic start for Josh Allen the first two weeks of the season in terms of how much he was passing. I mean, he went over career highs in both week one and week two in passing yards. So that's not going to continue the whole year. His attempts in week one were in the 40s, which is not something you usually see. So is it going to be the same? Okay, can we get eight to 10 targets out of digs? I still do think that in a game where Allen only throws maybe 34, 35 times, you can easily get a 25 to 30% target share out of Stefan Diggs, which is what he's been seeing so far on the season right now. So Stefan Diggs, for me, it's just a pay up to be contrarian spot. We obviously know how good this guy is and everybody doesn't want to play him because look, it's hard to stack this Buffalo team. It's been winning some Millie makers, some big tournaments over the, the first week or two of the season. You get yourself Cole Beasley, if he's going to be healthy, a John Brown option is grading out well for me this week. Obviously, Stefan Diggs, those are your main stacking options and you can bring it back with somebody from the other side, but he's not being owned right now because if I just pull up the wide receivers right now in terms of projected ownership and what you're going to be seeing on the top end, you're going to see a lot of people gravitate towards Tyree Kill. You're going to see a lot of people, especially if Julio Jones is out, which is trending on six days of a short week playing on Monday night, tweaking his hamstring, probably going to miss. Calvin Ridley, people are going to want to get to. People already want to get to Amari Cooper and we know that. So options in terms of paying up, DeAndre Hopkins is up there. Nobody is really going to be looking at it. And as of right now, nobody is looking at the updated ownership is still going to be around 5% on Stefan Diggs. We know the upside that this guy has. We know that he can be the number one scorer out of any position on the slate. So give me Stefan Diggs at just right now around 5% projected ownership. I like that a good amount. Even if it's not in a stack with Josh Allen, even if you just want to play him as a one-off, not in cash, this is GPP show, right? We're talking about ownership percentages. If you just want to play him as a one-off, right? That's your one-off spot. You get the cheap kind of maybe Carolina stack this week. And then you say, you know what? I'm going to get myself also, since it's a little bit chalkier with those Carolina receivers, I'm going to get myself Stefan Diggs to kind of balance that stack out. Bam, you just have a lot more upside in your lineups at low ownership. And finally, the next spot up is going to be tight end from the Dallas Cowboys, bang, Dalton Schultz. So Dalton Schultz looks like the real deal right now for the Dallas Cowboys. Their offense clearly looks like the real deal. A couple of things to say about tight end. I was tempted to just find a guy like 2,500 and just say, fuck it, just punt the position. You got zero points last week out of Adam Trotman if you played him. And a lot of people were winning millie makers. A lot of people were winning first place GPPs, just getting zero points out of them, right? If you're going to pay for a guy who's 4,500 and he's going to get you six points, just go $2,000 less, get a guy who's zero points and open yourself up to guys who are going to score like 20 more points for a ceiling potential in their stacks at other positions. But instead of just going and finding like a random $2,500 guy and saying, you know, this is that one guy for this week, because I'm trying to find upside here, not just guys that make your lineups work. Although there's a little bit of a balance there that can really pay off for you. I think that the guy this week is going to be Dalton Schultz, who's in that 4k range. And look, this is the thing, like people want to say that they're not going to be playing like the Dallas Cowboys every single week. But right now, yeah, Dak's going to pick up ownership. Amari's going to pick up a decent amount of ownership. He should be higher owned. But as it stands right now, CD Lamb, who is not expensive, in my opinion, just 6k is still going to be in the single digits in ownership or pushing 
pushing it. Michael Gallup might be 15% owned. So like these Dallas receivers, if you put them in a stack, you're still going to have a unique lineup. And if you want to use Dalton Schultz, you're definitely gonna have a unique lineup because as of right now, he's only coming in at around 5% ownership. He's probably a nice situation where you can go if you want to build the chalky stack of Amari and Dak, you put Dalton Schultz in there and now you want to run it back. Not a lot of people are going to be use, utilizing that type of a lineup. And obviously there's a lot of upside there. I mean, right now I'm projecting these Dallas stacks to look very good with Dak being my most projected player out of any position. We're talking wide receivers. We're talking running backs as well. And also the quarterbacks ahead of him in Mahomes and Lamar. So he's looking good. So his stacking options, of course, look good. In three and a half games, you have to remember that Blake Jarwin got hurt in the first half of week one. So in three and a half games, you've seen 75% snaps, 34 routes run per game. That is fourth in the NFL. But again, he did not play in the first half of that game. So he's really right now looking like the number one or number two usage tight end in the NFL. Obviously, the Cowboys are running a lot of plays on offense and running a lot of passing plays because they've been trailing in these games. So it is somewhat skewed by that, but you're getting a 14 percent target share in the NFL's number one passing offense so far, and they're going to get an even better matchup than they've been having against the Giants this week. Maybe it's not one if the Giants offense can't keep up or they're going to have to throw 40 plus times, but we've been saying that pretty much every single week so far, and it's continued to happen no matter which offense runs in there. Seven targets per game is top five in the NFL for tight ends. He's seen three deep targets, and he's also seen five red zone looks as well. So it looks really good. 18 catches over 215 yards and two touchdowns on the season. Those are all top six numbers in the NFL so far, and he has done it in two less quarters than anybody else right now in the slate. And look, he's still not mad massively expensive given the role that he's going to be having in this offense and given the usage that he's seeing right now. Like he should be in the 5k range, low 5k range in my opinion. And then I'd be like, okay, that's too expensive, but I understand why. But if he's going to be in this mid 4k range at this point, he's just a cheaper wide receiver option. You can look at him as based on the amount of routes that he's running in this well-powered offense. So if you want to go Dak with Dalton Schultz, no matter which wide receiver you put in after that, especially if it's a Gallup or a CeeDee Lamb, who are going to be lower on than Amari, you have yourself a unique Dallas stack, run it back with whoever you want on the opposite side of that game. And you're good to go. Like Darius Slayton is going to be chalky this week. If you want access to Darius Slayton and Amari and Dak Prescott this week without having a ton of people have those guys in their lineup. They're going to have it, but just be giving yourself a chance of being unique after that. I think the code to that this week is going to be probably going to Dalton Schultz, who's just going to be right around 5% home. And right there alone, you wipe out a ton of lineups that potentially look the same as yours starting off the bat just by putting Dalton Schultz in there. So those are my that one dudes for each position. Again, just keep an eye on Raheem Mostard. If he's out, I like Jarek McKinnon as well a lot, but I like Gibson a good amount as well. This does not mean, oh, I watched that video. I got to put all these guys in my lineup. These guys are low upside to hit probability options, right? That's why they're lower owned. The field is sharp. The field will own the guys who look like they're going to hit the cash type of plays. But there are still guys who have upside that they're not looking at. And I think the guys that I mentioned in this video are those guys. It does not mean put all of them into your lineup. If you want to put some of them into your lineup, that is completely fine. If you want to put all of them into your lineup, that's fine too. But you're taking on a lot of risk then because you don't have to just play 2% guys in every single position. Just get one or two guys who are lower owned in your lineup, or really just one guy who's lower owned in your stack, hence Dalton Schultz into your Dallas stacks, and you're good to go. You're set on your way. So I appreciate you tuning into this video. If you like this video, if you enjoy the concept of these that one dude videos, please do take a second of your time to hit the like and subscribe button really just sharing these videos as well just word amount just sharing it on twitter sharing it with some friends putting the link into a group message i really do appreciate all that in advance thank you all so much you can find on twitter the rest of my content for this week and really we're just going to be doing a live stream on sunday morning since you're seeing this on saturday so you can find all the other content that i've already released this week on my twitter pinned up in my profile my content schedule at sal Vetri dfs be sure to like and subscribe before you go and check out super draft the promo code sal sal the link is down below to get over there and make your first deposit you get a 50 percent deposit match up to a thousand dollar Ruskies in a slow drip format. You can check out the multiplier format. I also have a ton, a ton of tools, helpful information. The more informed you are, the better your odds of winning. Last week, we had a ton of people winning, myself included, finishing top five in tournaments, finishing first in some tournaments. I finished second in the 333. It was a really good week last week. So come ahead, join the team over on Patreon, get yourself more informed and increase your chances of winning. We're not going to guarantee you any winnings. You actually have to put the work in. You have to actually study this stuff, but I have a bunch of tools over there that will help you out. So thank you so much. My name's Sal. I appreciate y'all tuning in and I'll see you in the next one.